want to thank uh, everyone for uh, joining us here tonight. Um, my name is Robert Hayes. I'm the Community Outreach Librarian and Head of Technical Services here at the Tewksbury Public Library. And let me pull up my uh, little speech here. This will, uh, so you're going to have to listen to me for just a minute or two, and then we'll get to the really good stuff. But obviously, we're all here tonight uh, for the next hour or so uh, for best-selling author Ace Atkins. Uh, he's going to be discussing his latest book, uh, Robert B. Parker's Someone to Watch Over Me, uh, the newest Spencer novel. Uh, and he'll be in conversation with author Ingrid Thoft. Um, as I said before, we get to the good stuff. Just want to make a few quick points. Uh, first, I'd like to thank everyone behind the scenes for making this event possible. Uh, this is a collaboration between six North of Boston libraries. I'd like to thank Stephanie from Andover, Lynn from North Reading, Rebecca from Woburn, Charlotte and Erin from Wilmington, and Jessica from Chelmsford. I'd also really like to thank our bookstore partner, uh, Wellesley Books, and especially uh, Jane over at Wellesley Books. And I want to thank Katie McKee from uh, Penguin, Penguin Random House for pulling this all together for us. Uh, secondly, uh, this event is part of a series of virtual events from best-selling authors that we're hosting. Our next virtual author visit is Friday, January 29th at 7 o'clock, so in one week. Uh, we'll be hosting Douglas Preston and Lincoln Child. Uh, they'll be discussing their latest thriller, The Scorpion's Tale, and that will be in conversation with best-selling author Hank Philippi Ryan. Uh, third, uh, just know that this event is currently being live streamed on YouTube and on the Tewksbury Library's Facebook page. Uh, please give our library's Facebook page a like and feel free to share this video. Uh, and by the way, we uh, shared a lot of great Bernie Sanders memes earlier today. So <laughs> check out our Facebook page. Uh, fourth, uh, you'll be receiving a feedback survey tomorrow. Uh, please let us know what you thought of ton uh, tonight's event and what you'd like to see for future events. Uh, also in the uh, feedback survey, which you'll receive via email, uh, there'll be a link to purchase an autographed copy of Ace's latest book that he'll be discussing tonight. And then finally, just to set expectations, I anticipate this, uh, this event lasting about an hour. Uh, Ace and Ingrid are gonna have a discussion um, and uh, then we'll take questions from the audience. Um, you must type your questions into the Q&A box. So comments can go into the comment box, but questions should go into the Q&A box. And uh, Ingrid will be monitoring the Q&A and we'll eventually get to those questions um, towards the end of the program. Uh, also, for anyone who submitted a question in advance, I did already pass those along to Ingrid. All right, so let me introduce Ingrid, tonight's moderator. Uh, born in Boston, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. Ingrid is the author of the critically acclaimed Fina Ludlow series uh, in Loyalty, Identity, Brutality, and Duplicity. Uh, the Boston private investigator tangles with the city's criminal, cr criminal elements and her family of personal injury attorneys. The series has been called Dazzling by Publishers Weekly and a mod modern noir with a new generation kick-ass heroine by the Cleveland Plain Dealer. And Brutality, Loyalty, loyalty and duplicity, duplicity have gone on to win uh, several awards. Um, let's see, Ingrid earned a certificate in private investigation from the University of Washington, very cool. And she's also a graduate of Wellesley College. College. Uh, she lives in Seattle with her husband and is currently working on her fifth novel. And, uh, and then also, uh, it's my pleasure, my honor to introduce Ace Atkins. Uh, Ace is the New York Times bestselling author of 27 books, including 10 books in the Quinn Colson series. Handpicked by the Robert B. Parker estate nearly a decade ago to continue the Spencer series, he's written nine novels about the iconic private eye. Uh, he lives and works in Oxford, Mississippi. So let's all give a big virtual round of applause to Ingrid <laughs> and Ace for joining us here tonight. And Ingrid, you could take it away. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks, Robert. Thank you, Ace, for being here. And thanks to all the libraries and to Wellesley Books, a bookstore which is close to my heart, given that um, I went to Wellesley. So I'm going to just add to the accolades. And first, I'm just making sure I can see everyone. Okay, I'm adding to the accolades, Ace. Please. I won't do it, okay. I won't do it for long, but no, I'll do it no, for a little the, bit. The, the whole hour um, of accolades. Let's just do it. Okay, so you've been nominated for every major crime fiction award, including three times for the Edgar, which mystery readers will know is kind of the Oscar of the mystery writing world. Uh, and you, I nominated myself for those those awards. A lot of people don't know that. But I, I wasn't going to mention that. 
but you know, now the cat's out of the bag. Yeah. You also earned a Pulitzer Prize nomination. I did. I filled okay. out a form on that. I sent that away. So, I'm and like that the, was for something in the Tampa Tribune. Is that right? That's right. As I like to say, I'm kind of like the Susan Lucci of, of awards. You got you got nominated, a lot of a lot of nominations. Yes, yes yeah. It, it's an honor just to be nominated. That's what I always tell people. Wonderland was adapted into a television series with Mark Wahlberg and which was called Spencer Confidential. And right then on. your Quinn Colson novels are going to be adapted as a TV series by HBO, which is extremely exciting. You can tell us more about that or not more sure. about it because you don't sure, have no. anything to say about it later. But we got an hour to talk. We can tell we'll, talk about all this stuff. We'll get to that. So someone to watch over me, over my shoulder, read it, loved it. Um, the little description for those of you who haven't yet read it is in this latest thriller featuring the legendary Boston P.I. Spencer and his young protege Maggie Sullivan. They take on a billionaire money manager running a network of underage girls for his rich and powerful clients. Book list, loved it. They said in this continuation of Robert B. Parker's beloved Spencer series, Atkins continues to do the late author proud. That's high praise. And you deliver another engrossing thriller. And addictive, the Seattle Times calls it. And then also some other accolades. I want to talk about Quinn Colson at some point because you know I have a soft spot for him. Um, and you're getting lots of great reviews all over Amazon. The dialogue and the banter of the characters is what keeps me coming back for more. This one was particularly good and I couldn't put it down, says Patty on Amazon. There you go. We don't know who Patty is. Patty is my mother, but that's we... <laughs> she's Patty, my mom Patty. She just she's been supporting me for years. You guys go way back. We go. Okay. Way back. Yeah. So it's first cool. of all, since it's it is cocktail time where you are, um, mm -hmm. what are you drinking? I know you like a good scotch. A good I do like uh, like Spencer. He enjoys uh, his his beer and whiskey, and so I'm enjoying some Eagle Rare whiskey, some nice uh, Kentucky bourbon this evening. Okay. So, a little bit chilly down here in Mississippi, probably not like it is in Boston. I don't know how it is in Seattle, but uh, yeah. it's, it's cocktail hour. And so good time to, and are, are you drinking at, at all or? You know, it's only four in Seattle. So it seemed a little early. Um, so I, but my um, bartender gave yes. me a very fancy ice cube in my Diet Coke. One of these, oh, you know, nice. just a single sphere. So I feel sure. as if I'm, I'm with you in spirit. I'll take it. So I'm from Marblehead, which is north of Boston, and was born in Boston and grew up there. And I wondered how much time had you spent in the city before you started writing the, the Spencer series? Do you know, honestly, I, I had not spent a great deal of uh, time in Boston before I started writing the books 10 years ago. I can't mm -hmm. believe now it's been exactly 10 years ago uh, wow. since I've been on this track. Um, but over the last 10 years, I have gotten to know the city very mm -hmm. well. Um, thanks uh, in no small part to uh, the late Joan Parker, who was my mm -hmm. Boston mentor, and, and Joan Parker knew everybody in Boston, and if there was something that I needed to know or someone I had to connect with, Joan helped me out. Yeah. And also uh, Bob Parker's uh, best friend, a man named Mel Farman, who just recently mm -hmm. passed away, right. who was uh, Bob's best friend of over 50 years. He helped him with research. He, mm -hmm. he read his manuscripts. He helped back up wow. his books. And he became my uh, very, very dear friend over these last 10 years and could not have done it without him. So in short, I feel like now after 10 years on, Boston has become a second home to me. Nice. And um, during the pandemic, I just hate that I haven't been able to visit mm -hmm. as much as I normally do. Yep. Is jo was Joan like Susan Silverman? She was uh, famously, a lot of people talked about, hey, did you ever get to meet Joan? I know- No, I did not, her. unfortunately. Uh, Joan was the best. And she was the one who really hired me. She was the one that mm -hmm. you know picked me to, to continue these books. Uh, she was like Susan, only mm -hmm. she was better. Um, uh, Susan, some people have complained, has been a little bit needy and you know a little bit uh, you know she kind of relies on Spencer to kind of you know prop her up sometimes. Or people would make those complaints. Joan uh, suffered no fools. Mm -hmm. uh, she was tough. She was brilliant. Uh, she was funny. She was direct. Uh, I think at Susan Silverman's best moments, she mm. echoed Joan, uh, okay. but not as good as Joan Parker. Nobody would ever be as good as Joan Parker. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So in this particular book, the for those who haven't read it, is a rather dark topic, uh, subject matter, which kind of mimics things that have gone on in the news recently. 
I always find as a writer, it's hard when you're writing about stuff that's heavy and icky. How did you manage that? And, and it's a, a subject matter that also involves young people, um, teenagers now, and I know you have kids. So was that hard every day kind of going in and out of that? Well, I think one of the reasons I was, I really wanted to talk to you on this call is not only with your Boston connection, but we share so much in common with kind of what I'd say that our worldview. Um, I think in your books, uh, in, in, in Fina's world, she takes on so much dark subject matter and some really weighty stuff dealing with religion and family yeah. issues, that kind of thing. but there's so much humor in it. And mm -hmm. I think that, and we'll get into this, I guess, a little bit later talking about it, but I know that you were influenced by Robert Parker and I was influenced by Robert Parker too, which is we understand, I think, that the world is a dirty, corrupt place. There are bad people. There are evil people in this world, but it doesn't have to come into the characters. And I think that's the longevity of the success of Spencer is I think that he gives a, a bright side of what can be a very dirty, twisted world. And, um, you know, even though you have dealt with heavy, weighty matter, um, I don't feel bogged down when I read your novels. I, there's, a, there's a lot of... Um, not not a light touch, but there's a comedic edge to it. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of humor that I find really refreshing that I don't necessarily see in most mm -hmm. crime book fiction yeah. or, or most thrillers. Um, and I don't like to read books that are downers. Right. Uh, but I think that you can take on a weighty subject like this, uh, which is dealing with, you know, a guy who's a, a sex trafficker dealing, you know, right. obviously, they, you know, I, I was inspired by the Jeffrey Epstein story. Right, that's what I thought. Um, yeah, and, and so, you know, it's not the Jeffrey Epstein story, but it's very much a character much like Jeffrey Epstein that I wanted yep. Spencer to encounter. Um, but it doesn't necessarily influence who Spencer is. And of course, the great right. thing about the crime novels uh, in, in Raimi's books is that we can actually find some kind of closure and we can find some kind of justice, which is not always the case in the real world. I think that's a big appeal. And I think in many respects, the, the main character kind of takes that burden for the reader because you know that the main character, you know Spencer's gonna do something about it. And, and in this case, Maddie also. So as a reader, you kind of don't have to be burdened by it, which I think is part of the reason that books like that don't bog you down. And I mean, I think these days things are, are fairly dark and, and, and pressing upon us, both with health issues and yeah. things that are going on in the world um, politically and you know, uh, unrest going on in our communities and people looking for social justice. I think that it's hard for me right now to read books that don't have uh, a sliver in, of humor in them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that kind of um, sometimes can take the, uh, the edge off the, the darkness in our society. And I think that, uh, you know, comedy or a little bit of, uh, of a light touch sometimes can make all the difference in being able to just survive these times. Someone recently told me they were choosing this moment to read The Plague. <laughs> <laughs> which I thought seemed like a terrible I idea. I can't read anything dark right now. I can't read it. You know, I couldn't watch The, the Handmaid's Tale right now. I, I, couldn't, couldn't, I couldn't either. It was, it was it re kind of reflected too much of what I felt was going on. I definitely I don't know. Could, couldn't agree more. I mean, it's a great show. It was a wonderful show, wonderful book, but it's just those kind of things. So I think that, you know, a little bit of escapism, it doesn't mean we can't take on serious issues. I know that you have in all your FINA books, you've taken on serious issues and serious bad guys and things that are in the real world. But, you know, we like our heroes. We like the people who are navigating these worlds. It all goes back for me and for you, for Robert Parker. It goes back to Raymond Chandler. It goes back to Dashiell Hammett. Um, it's the, you know, the world we weary investigator, the world weary yeah. hero that can, you know, be the, be the lightness in the, in the dark. So reading Maddie about Maddie Sullivan, who is a really fun character. She's, you know, she takes no prisoners. She's ready to get in there, often in times in ways where she really would be over her head. And Spencer tries to balance that. Is it fun to write her? And has it changed Spencer by having her um, as his protege? Well, going back to the very first novel that I wrote, and it's a long story, and you and I uh, shared the same editor for, for many mm -hmm. years, uh, Chris Pepe, one of our uh, close friends. And Chris was Bob's editor going back way back. I think she was editing Bob when she was 15 years old. You know, she, I mean, she was like, you know, when she was, I think she was in her she'll, early She'll 20s. appreciate that. She, well, she, I think she was in her early 20s when she, yes, started, she was. She was. She started editing Bob Parker. So she edited him for years and years and years. Um, but I think that, uh, go back to your, I'm sorry, tell me your question again. Uh, it was about Maddie and how, oh. what it was like to write her and also how you saw her as kind of a, you know, what she provided for the Spencer character. Well, um, 
so would Chris, we were talking about this, uh, Chris Pepe came to me and she was, we were talking about, you know, me writing 50 pages, which uh, possibly could be the next Spencer novel. The one thing that I wanted to do was I really wanted to bring in um, a good story. I didn't want to just write a novel that would be interesting because Spencer was in it, a run of the mill mm -hmm. mystery or whatever. And, you know, who cares? We're only interested in it because there's a character named Spencer in it. I wanted to really bring a, a story that would be interesting if it was a John Smith investigator, you know, just a, a, or standalone. So I had found out about a story here. I was helping uh, with a group here in Mississippi, um, which is a national group called the Innocence Project. And mm -hmm. I was helping doing a little, I used to be a, a newspaper reporter and I was helping with a little bit with an investigation, a little background uh, of a guy that was on death row okay. that uh, they were checking out uh, his story, possibly looking into to different legal channels for him. Mm -hmm. And what struck me, the way they came in contact with him was this was involving uh, a murder of a woman in the Mississippi Delta who had been killed when um, her daughter was nine, 10 years old. Okay. And uh, later on, she ended up getting to know the man who was on death row serving time for the, wow. the murder of her mother. But she believed this man was innocent. Wow. And she believed the wrong man was on death row. And she was actually the catalyst to get people involved to look into his case. Okay. And that story was so personally powerful and so interesting mm -hmm. to me. That's who Maddie Sullivan is. And so okay. that is what I wanted to bring in. And of course, instead of a young girl from the Mississippi Delta, this yeah. is a young girl that grew up in the, in the, in the projects in Southie. Yeah. And she grew up in South, South Boston. And so I tried to take that story that I knew about and make it very Boston centric. And to answer your question, she is a lot of fun to write about, uh, you know, not only uh, the scenarios based on a true story, but I obviously was very inspired by one of my favorite novels of all time, True Grit. Yeah. Uh, and the character of Maddie Ross, which she's mm -hmm. named for, and yeah. uh, Maddie Ross trying to track down the the no good coward that murdered her father. And yeah. so I liked her spunk, I liked her determination, mm -hmm. and I liked the way she went into things uh, headlong. And so anyway, that's where we are today. We are with looking in 10 years in a character that I created for the very first Spencer novel that I wrote, okay. catching up with her now uh, as a young woman. Will we see more of her in the future? Uh, I hope so. I, I hope she, I think she's part of the, the, the Spencer verse now. She's a, uh, she's one of the characters and I hope she continues on, um, you know, even after the point where, you know, I'm writing these books, I think she'll be, hopefully other writers, if they, if they do take this uh, character on, they'll, they'll, they'll write about Maddie. I, I love writing for her. Yeah. When you were talking about Boston, um, one of the things I love reading the books now that I don't live there anymore is reading about the food. And you, uh, there are a couple scenes in Davios and, you know, I could just remember back to the gnocchi at Davios is amazing in case any of you people haven't had it, you should go. They, the waiter described it as little pillows of heaven. <laughs> and I, I can't disagree. Yes. So it, Davios, I know when you- Davios is like one of my favorite yeah. places there and legal seafood or like right when I get to Boston, that's, yeah. I, make, I make a beeline for it. So when you go, I know from following you on Instagram that you usually try to get out and have the, the food and take in kind of the lo local flavor. Sure. And is that, do you go back to the same places now that you've been writing this for a while or are you always trying to find new places in the city, new haunts? I mean, Boston is such a grand place for food and uh, you know, it, it's, just a, it's just heaven when you go there. To, and, and it really part of my job, I always joke, when people ask me about going back to Boston for um, research, what I do for research, you know, uh, it is a fair amount of drinking and eating and, and yeah. checking out these places. And that's what we loved about the, the part, you know, the, the world that Robert Parker created. Right. You can almost see a timeline going back to the early mm -hmm. 70s up until now of the change in Boston restaurants and seeing yeah. what was popular at the time and what people were drinking and what people were eating. I mean, Bob Parker was almost a food blog. He was a food blogger before there was even such thing. Right. So, you know, it's not necessarily that I'm out doing criminal investigations. <laughs> it's really trying to get the, the local scene right. Uh, yeah. And it was something that, uh, you know, Joan Parker knew very well. There was no, you know, when, when I would go to dinner with Joan Parker, um, she, it was like going out to dinner with, with the queen. You know, you would go to dinner with Joan Parker and the chef would come out to say hello yeah. to her, you know. And yeah. so uh, I try to keep that tradition going, trying to keep things very current. Now, I know you sometimes write books with a soundtrack going while you're writing. Uh, Did you have one for someone to watch over me? You know, for, for Spencer, 
and this was something, you know, Chris and I talked about in the very early days of how this would go on. The only thing that was really impressed upon me about writing Spencer was that the character remained contemporary. Yeah. Uh, Chris really felt, and so did Joan, and so did uh, uh, Parker's sons, that the longevity and the success of Spencer is that he is of the current times, the current yep. age. So, you know, we talked about the references that Spencer would make as far as old movies, mm -hmm. or as far as, you know, the type of music he listened to, but I wanted to keep it exactly as it was. I mean, I love old movies. I love Turner classic movies. I love classic jazz. Um, I like the, you know, the great American sound. Uh, yeah, songbook. You know, soundbook that, that, you know, is permeates the Spencer novels. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to keep that kind of feeling of the classic Americana in those books. Mm -hmm. So yeah, when I'm going back and writing Spencer, you know, trying to get the feel right, trying to get the tone right, it's a lot going back to, you know, listening to Ella Fitzgerald, you know, okay. or listening to John Coltrane or, uh, you know, Hoagie Carmichael. And, and, and that's to me, that's just Spencer. And if you don't have that, then okay. that's not who he is. Um, but Do yeah. Do you listen while you actually write? You know, I can't, I, I don't know about you, Ingrid, I don't know if you do, do this or not. I can't listen to lyrics yeah. when I'm writing, but I can listen to, uh, I could listen to jazz uh, instrumentals. Um, I could listen to, uh, there's a, just a fantastic, you know, people in Boston that were listening to will know who I'm talking about, but there was a man named Dave McKenna, mm -hmm. a legendary jazz piano player that uh, played for many years at the Fairmont Hotel mm -hmm. uh, uh, in Boston. And um, he was somebody that actually Parker mentioned in the books, in, mm -hmm. in the Spencer books. And he was just a beautiful piano player. And when I really need to zone in and get the feel of Spencer, the feel of the mm -hmm. writing, I'll find uh, Dave McKenna on Spotify. And that just brings me right on home. Interesting. Yeah. So I want to change gears a little bit. I'm looking at the time and I want to make sure we talk sure. about Quinn Colson a bit. Um, sure. Thank you. For readers who aren't familiar with the Queen Colson series, it's this other series. And how do you pronounce the county in Mississippi? It's funny you mentioned that to me. Like, I think, well, you guys have a lot of Native American names up there yeah. as well. Uh, or, uh, but for me, um, you know, everything here, most of the names of the cities and counties, many of them are Native American. So it's it's called Tibaha County. Within, Tibaha, in okay. A lot of the stuff that I'm doing down here is inspired uh, greatly by you know, this writer that some of you might know, named Lee Faulkner, he was, he was a pretty good writer. And so of course his, <laughs> it was uh, Yachna Patofa County. So it's not as complicated as Yachna Patofa County, okay. but um, um, Tibaha County is, is the county. I like this. to know, so I'm doing it right in my head when I'm reading. Yes, Tibaha, yes. it's Tibaha County. Yeah. Okay. It, it was a lot, it was a lot longer uh, with a lot more vowels in it, but yeah. my uh, editor before I started working with Chris, a guy named Neil Myron said, oh. uh, mm -hmm. please give us something we can even remotely pronounce. That's, so that's, that's what, nice. It got pared down a little bit. Good. So uh, in Tibaha County, Quinn Colson is a former army ranger, sheriff, but that has undergone some changes as the politics have changed. Why did you decide to, or how did you choose to make him be a ranger? Um, you know, my intention was never, I don't really enjoy what I'd call the, and I, I don't think Robert Parker did either, the, the overly macho guy with the gun, you know, ex-Navy SEAL. I just, I, I don't care about that. And, and that yeah. really wasn't my intention with making him a ranger. I um, went to high school and I went to college at uh, Auburn University, uh, which is very close to uh, Columbus, Georgia, uh, mm -hmm. where the famous, uh, where Fort Benning is and where the, you know, the, the, the home of the ranger uh, regiment is. Yeah. And so growing up, I was always very familiar with the uh, the st stories of the rangers the history of the rangers it was just kind of part of the local lore and yeah. so that's why i decided to make him a ranger but you know really the idea of just having a what i call kind of a kind of boy spencer is the the quintessential american detective i just want this guy to be like the quintessential american hero who comes home and i mean it, the story is not original uh mm -hmm. you know we've seen this a thousand times going back to the odyssey Right. Seeing a guy who was a warrior come, he was just a, he's just yeah. a warrior who comes back home. But it, my intention was never to write like a, a techno thriller hero, tough guy with gun. I really wanted right. to almost do like the the antithesis of that. But the reason why I made him a ranger was really from my personal history of, of yeah. living so close to Fort Benning and and um, you know it just was a I, I I love the history of the rangers and I love the history of the 
um, the, the regiment and everything they've done. So it just seemed like the, the kind of the quintessential American story to tell. Well, I think it's great because you know, you get the sense he's very capable and can do all kinds of things and has that training, that experience, but he's not every moment, you know, kicking someone's ass basically. So, right, it's kind right. of that, you know, he's thoughtful. He's a very thoughtful character, which I think is one of I the- hope so. I, I hope so. I hope that comes out. Um, yeah. I mean, the, really the, the biggest uh, influence for me in these books, I promise you, I'm not kidding, was Andy Griffith. And I love the idea that Andy Griffith on the Andy Griffith, Griffith show was just kind of this moral compass for this world in this this small town and, and yep. you know Tibaha County is essentially like you know an R-rated version of Mayberry yes. and you know, the it, people, yes. you know Andy Griffith did not have to you know encounter um, you know meth heads and killers and bank robbers and whatever and strippers like, and, and strippers and dirtier you know it's like a you know an edgier version of Mayberry but it was I just I like the way that Andy Griffith was just kind of this calm presence that kind of knew the right thing to do. And I think that, you know, not to go f too far on this topic, but I think, again, that's the moral compass that Spencer has provided over the years is he's always lived by the code. Yes. He's always lived with honor and decency. And I think that that's something that is in very, very short supply these days. And sometimes yep. people will ask us, and I'm sure they've asked you many times mm -hmm. talking about why do you write crime novels? Why don't you write a story about a coming of age story or something about a you know a woman who discovers herself through basket weaving or something why don't you write that why do you write about a you know or why don't i write a book about a you know why don't you a, write that book? why don't i write the book about the man discovering himself through basket weaving or whatever whatever but i think that um you know it's it's that moral compass and yeah. i think that's what the importance of these books provide and and i do think people things that we take for granted is just basic human decency has been trampled on these days and and you know um i i hope quinn colson has that in him uh and if he does it's certainly something i learned from robert b parker interesting so to, in either series or talk about both of them do you have a favorite favorite character to write and do you have a least favorite character favorite character or least favorite and at least favorite can be just because you find them the most difficult to write or you know, I'll be honest with you, the most fun characters for me to write, and I, I'm going to turn this back on you because I want to hear you answer the same question. Okay. Um, I love writing for the bad guys. Mm -hmm. I think I could do an entire book uh, sometimes, you know, just with the, with the bad guys. They're the most fun to write. So I have, you know, um, you know, I don't know because Spencer is a first person novel, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of, you know, him, you know, going, I, I don't know if it's as much, but in the, the Quinn books where I can get into the heads of the bad guys, like a somebody yeah. like a character like Johnny Stagg, who's a yeah. Dixie Mafia guy that runs this truck stop in North Mississippi. He's just a joy to write for. I could sit down and write a scene with him right now. I think sometimes, um, you know, some of the more straight characters are a little bit tougher to write for because they're not as much fun. Yeah. Um, you know, I have more fun. But for you, do you have that with, with, uh, with your books? Are you, who? I mean, is, is Fina the most fun for you to write for? Or do you like to write... Fina's a lot of fun because um, she does and says things that I am too polite to do and say or say. And so I don't know. I've heard you say many things. <laughs> yeah, a, all right. Well, then most let's people. Get your, let's get say. let's get your husband back in here. Is he all? Let's get. <laughs> no, no, he's off. He's not available. Okay, all right. so she's a lot of fun to write, but I totally agree about the bad guys because, for instance, there's a pimp who's been in a couple of the books. He's so much fun to write. Like yeah. I love writing and he's 20 sure. something and he's, right. he thinks he's, you know, this tough guy and Fina kind of always cuts him down to size. And so I do think that's fun and it's fun to get into the heads of those characters and to see what drives them and what motivates them. So, um, yeah, I mean, if someone's all good, they're very boring, right? Yeah. So why did you want to, why would you want to write that? Absolutely. What about in the Ranger series? Um, you know, I, I really probably have the most difficulty writing for Quinn. I don't mean he's not a lot of fun to write yeah. for, but he is the kind of the moral compass. He's kind of the, he's really kind of the straight man in the world of the insanity. So, you know, writing yeah. about the guys who are the fences or the, the, mm -hmm. the people running the, you know, the, uh, the strip clubs or, you know, the, the criminals, those people yeah. are, are much more fun to write for. Um, you know, Spencer, you know, I have to go back, is really a joy mm -hmm. to write for. And, and Parker himself had this really kind of great detail. He said the reason people like Spencer, um, why Spencer's so much fun, he said, Spencer always thinks of the thing at the right moment 
that you mm -hmm. thought of that you wish you had said five minutes later. Yeah. And that's the key to it. like, you know, I, I, you know, you, somebody crosses you, somebody annoys you and you think yeah. about, damn, I wish I had said that five minutes later. And yeah. that's of course, you know, Parker said that he couldn't even think that fast. And he yeah. said, that's the great thing is you can leave your keyboard for a minute and then you can think of that great insult or that great comeback and then come back and put it on the page. Exactly. Uh, you know, everything that we wish we could say in a moment. But again, you know, that's the, the thing for me um, that's, I, I think the longevity of the, the, the private eye, the classic private eye story, which is what both what you and I do. And I, I, don't, I don't think a lot of people do this anymore. I know that there are a lot of private eye books, but I think that I do think it's a dying art. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, do, domestic suspense and yeah. international thrillers and, you know, girls on the subway and you know, all that, you know, <laughs> gone, the you know, all that, you know, women, Under the bus. all that stuff, right? But, you know, but as far as just, you know, um, having a um, classic private eye novel, which used to be the bread and butter of publishers for so many years, I don't think there's a lot of it on the so so it's a it's I really enjoy doing this. Do you don't you feel like it's kind of like a not a lost art, but something that uh you know is is it's an old fashioned type of storytelling. I think it's an old fashioned type of storytelling, and I think it's this really nice sweet spot yeah. where you you can have someone who's a crime fighter, and you can have their moral code be what guides them as opposed to the law necessarily, because we know our PIs don't always follow the law. Right. And I think that there's a lot of um, potential there for storytelling. And also it's just, it, you can, that wish for the moment you talked about, you know, where your character actually does take down the bad guy, which, right. you know, meanwhile, it's not happening in real life. So I think that that's kind of a, a, a unique thing about the genre. Yeah. And I think private eyes are so much fun to write about because, um, you know, we're a little bit more mistrustful of law enforcement. We, you know, like, like, you know, for Smell Like Spencer certainly, you know, appreciates law enforcement and has yep. friends like Quirk and uh, Belson, but but also knows that there's also great corruption in those departments as well. And I used to be a crime reporter and I, you know, 99% of the cops that I met were wonderful people and hardworking yep. people, but there were also a lot of people that I would also write about that, you know, came across in, in internal affairs. So um, I think the private investigator is just the, the perfect vehicle for telling stories. And I was on a panel a few years ago with a guy named Matt Goldman, who's a terrific uh, uh, writer, terrific private eye writer. And he was saying that he thought that these times more than ever, as we're looking at social injustice and mm -hmm. we're looking at, um, um, you know, really with, with all the, the issues in today's policing, that the private eye is sometimes the perfect vehicle to tell the yeah. story. And I think it goes back to, again, you know, we have to go back to everything we do. And I think Bob Parker, if he was joined on this, this uh, Zoom with us right now, would echo it. Uh, you know, you think about the time that Spencer came on the game in the 1970s, you know, um, yeah. the, the Nixon era, um, a lot of dirty, dirty stuff going on in Boston at the time. I mean, Boston yep. was a, you know, exceptionally corrupt city. Yep. The police department was exceptionally corrupt. Uh, so somebody like Spencer was so relevant at that time. And I think there was a time maybe when he felt a little bit old fashioned, but I think mm -hmm. now, you know, a private eye hero feels very contemporary. Yeah. You write, so you write two books a year, which I think is amazing. Um, and the next Quinn is coming out in July, correct? The Heathens? If I can finish it, yes. I'm joking. Okay. I'm joking. If anyone ever, my, my editors, well, I'm just kidding. Just, just. Katie, block your ears. <laughs> um, so do you write the books, it, having to do two books a year, do you write them at the same time? Are you writing them consecutively? How does that work? How does it work there's, in your brain? There's no, I mean, I think on the, you know, Overall, I think uh, the Quinn books and the Spencer books are very similar in the worldview, uh, mm -hmm. the kind of stories that I want to tell, the kind of hero that I want to present, the kind of things I want to say about, you know, a, about a, having a moral compass and about society. Yeah. I think it's all very similar. But I write a book, when I write a Spencer novel, I am writing it in the voice of Spencer. Mm -hmm. And when Bob Parker was writing three books a year, he was writing three books a year, Crazy. whether, I know, he, he, was, he was the best. And he was writing a Western, he was writing a Jesse yeah. Stone, he was writing a Spencer, sometimes he'd throw in a Sonny Randall. And he, yeah. But it all had the same voice. It yeah. always was the same voice. So even if he was writing about the Old West or he was writing Sonny right. Randall or he's writing, it all had, a, it all had that voice. But yep. for me, the hardest thing is, is to get into that Spencer voice, that Parker mm -hmm. voice, 
which is something that that we want and what what I think mm -hmm. gives um, a cohesion to the novels. Sure. And um, you know, so that's the the biggest challenge for me is is in writing two books a year is switching, and I cannot do it at the same time. It would be impossible. At the same time. Okay. Yeah. Do you have um, so say you don't have to think about fans or agents or editors? Is there a dream book you'd like to write? And I have some thoughts: a sure. romance. <laughs> sci-fi a cookbook uh i think if i could i would be like parker uh i would write a western and that's what i have been wanting to write a western because for me i and, and he famously wrote about this um in his dissertation um is the fact that the private eye is essentially just the western hero yep. who has come into the city Yep. And it's the urbanization of the the old West hero, and and I feel the same way. I feel like the that type of storytelling has just gone gone modern with what we're writing. Sure. But if I could someday, and there was not involved of what sells and what doesn't sell, and what right. I can do, I would write a western in a second. Interesting. What has surprised you most about being a published author? Because I know you were published before; you were a newspaper reporter. But for a novelist, what has surprised you most? Mm -hmm. What has surprised now, I'm going to turn that one on you. Uh, what what has surprised you, Ingrid? What has surprised you about when you had? Trick. What is it? That's a dirty trick. To talk about <laughs> me. What is it? Turn my turn that on you. What has surprised um, you about this whole thing? You know, one thing that has surprised me, uh, which is a, a delightful thing, mm -hmm. um, and this is evidence of it. This conversation is that the crime fiction community is just the greatest group of people. And I'm not surprised because I would think they wouldn't be nice people, but what we write about can be so dark yep. that you would think, well, maybe they're not going to be really generous and supportive. And, and that's just not true. I mean, there anyone I know in the crime community, if you come to them and say, hey, what are your thoughts? Or can you help me out? They do it. I, in fact, someone told me they said romance writers, they're like sharks. <laughs> Crime fiction writers are the greatest. So that's. You know, I, I have to echo that sentiment. Uh, I've been in this business now for oh, over 20 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, Bob Parker gave me uh, one of my very first blurbs on my book. Um, and uh, I agree. Um, there is uh, every, almost every person uh, that I've met in this world has been really wonderful and, and a lot of fun to be around. Um, so yeah, yeah that, is, that has been an added plus. So I'm just okay. going to jump on what you said. Well, I'm going to say, that, no, no, I, I gave you a moment there to think while you were refilling your mug. You don't have anything to add? No, to, to what's been unusual about publishing. I think the hard thing about publishing is, to be serious, is I think that um, to continue to write, it's one thing to get a book published. Yep. And uh, that was the one thing that I thought as a, as a writer, if I could just get one book published. Yep. But the hard thing is to continue to mm -hmm. write and stay published. Yes. And uh, I think that somebody like Parker is a real inspiration to both of us. I know you're greatly influenced by Parker. Yeah. And I think that um, and we'll talk about, I would love to talk about that a little bit more, but um, is to write the way he did with the level of um, uh, success that he had, but the level of quality that he continued with, yeah. um, you know, it takes a great deal of professionalism. So that's the, the thing that I learned is it's great that you're published. It's great you have a book out. But how are you going to continue doing this and how are you going to blend it into your lifestyle? So I that was something that I had to, you know, uh, kind of get square with. I think everyone has to. I think that there's that uh, that that learning curve exists and it's something you are constantly working on. I don't think there's ever really a moment where you feel like you have that mastered. When you talked about um, being influenced by Robert Parker, I definitely was. I mean, I love the Spencer books. Um, for when did, a time, when did, you start, when did you start reading Spencer and living in Boston, living in Marblehead or living in Marblehead, where did you, when did you first come across Parker and how much did that influence you into writing a private eye series? I think it had to have been that I, I mean, I think I was probably a teenager. I do remember that when the show was on with Robert Ehrlich, right? That's Ehrlich, is that his name? The TV or, show, they shot some of it in Marblehead. So there was that awareness of it. Um, but I kind of don't remember not knowing about the books, quite honestly, yeah. because they are so much a fabric. If you like to read and you're in the Boston area, from the Boston area, that's part of the canon, essentially, yeah. the way I think of it. Um, I, I just like the PI characters 
I like the, all the things we've been talking about, about having the moral compass, but also having freedom to do their own thing. And actually I had an agent who, uh, for my first book, Loyalty, read the beginning, loved it, read the rest of it, didn't love it. And I was gonna get a new agent and I did research and I found Helen Brand, um, my late agent and uh, Robert Parker's late agent. And I thought, okay, she represents Robert Parker. I think maybe she would like what I'm doing. And she did. Um, and so he influenced me not only in the writing and the reading, but then very specifically in the, the path I took when I was looking for new representation. Isn't that great? It, it's yeah. just, you read those certain books, I think, um, at, a, at a certain age that influence the kind of things you want to write about. And I think people yep. that are not into it or they don't understand the book business, they think we get into certain kind of books, maybe because for financial reasons or what's going to sell mm -hmm. most, whatever. And it's really... I think for good writers like you, I think that it's it's further from the truth uh, is that we get into the books that really in some way move us. And, right. and for me, when I read Parker, when I was you know, 14, 15, 16 yeah. years old, uh, it was just a watershed moment. And I knew, yeah. uh, you know, it, it's what led me to wanting to be a, a journalist. It's led me to yeah. uh, wanting to write crime novels. You know, it was just exactly the, yeah. the right feel and the tone. And, and I think it probably was the same thing for Bob with, with Chandler. Well, I always tell people, aspiring writers, I say, write what you want to read. And that was a big piece that's for me. It. That's, that's what it. I like to read. So I thought, of course, that's what I would if, want to yeah. try to write. If you don't do that, it's not an honest endeavor. You know? no. And, and uh, when you have to do this, for me, 20 years on and, and, and for us to, to continue to write this, if you don't enjoy it, then uh, there's a lot better ways of making money. There certainly are. All right, we're going to take questions in a minute, but I have a couple other, oh, one other question before we take some of the reader questions. Um, oh, I have so many good questions, but I'm just going to, have you had a memorable fan interaction? Um, a memorable fan, I've had a lot of crazy uh, fan <laughs> interactions. I'll tell you about that. That was in, um, I was in Gainesville, Florida a few years ago. And I could tell after the signing, there was a very nervous woman that wanted to talk to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and she waited until everything was over. And then she came up to me and started explaining to me uh, she was having a lot of trouble with her ex-husband who had embezzled <laughs> a lot of money from her. And oh I could God. tell that she thought that I was Spencer. Oh. She, not, she had kind of conflated the idea that I actually did the kind of work that Spencer did and that I could help her out. And she actually offered me money. Oh. Uh, she actually was prepared to give me a retainer to get going on her case. And and so, you know, of course, being a decent person, I, I took it and I cashed it. I never saw her again. Okay, that's that's pretty that's pretty far out there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, we're going to get to some questions and everyone out there bear with me because I'm kind of doing multitasking here. Um, we talked about this before everyone joined us, Spencer's age and how you manage, you know, some people they have not a lot of them. I know Chuck Box, his um, Joe Pickett, he kind of ages as we age. Um, but, you know, my my books, they don't do that. How do you manage age and the, the the changing of time, especially with a series, for the Spencer series, which has been around for so long? Yeah, it's funny. People get so caught up on this uh, and they really get into it. And I think I mentioned to you before we started, there's one guy that's on my Facebook page that constantly wants to remind me exactly how old Spencer is. And, you know, I like to joke yeah. with him. I said, you know, he takes Geritol and Geritol just makes you just, you know, <laughs> kick ass at 90 years old. And of course, you know, we all know James Bond is 125 years old. So I mean, yeah, James but he Bond looks fantastic. He does. He looks amazing. Yeah. Again, it goes to a really clear thing, which is Joan Parker and Chris, our, our former editor, wonderful editor, yeah. uh, very rightly said, Spencer must remain contemporary. He must be of the time. So when I first started writing these books, Spencer was 50 years old, you know, yep. uh, and now uh, he's 60. And so I have aged him. I have aged him. Yep. Um, but uh, Parker did not. Parker stopped aging him where he was somewhere around 50. And I kind of unpaused him and let him get a little bit older. I thought it was interesting. I thought it was interesting that you know he'd been doing all this stuff for all the many years, uh, mm -hmm. not taking in a strict timeline. I mean, the TV show with Robert Urich uh, uh, didn't do that as well. Yep. Um, you know, He was a Vietnam veteran in that show. So right. I just, the version of Spencer that I write about is probably around 60 years old. And that's just what I go with. I don't think it's a major part of it. I just think he's got a lot of wear and tear on him. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we've had a couple of questions about your, the audiobooks, And wondering, one person said, 
Marty said, Joe Mantegna was fantastic narrator for someone to watch over me. Do you pick the narrator for your audiobooks? And do you have a favorite audiobook narrator? And do you listen to them? Um, Answer whichever question you want. I do have something to say about the Quinn Polson series. Um, oh, yes. Uh, there's a uh, McLeod Andrews who does the, the books. Uh, I, I found him. I, I heard him reading a Robert Cray's book, and he was just terrific. Uh, and so I reached out to, to get him to read my books and he's just the best damn, um, cool. reader ever. Um, but Joe Montana had been reading the Spencer books for years and I, he was, a, he was somebody who had been a Spencer fan and I think some way reached out to Robert Parker. And of course he'd also did some lifetime movies where he played Spencer and, hmm. uh, he's terrific. You know, I, I hear people say, well, I watched this movie and he wasn't big enough and he wasn't tough enough for it he gets the character just right. Like the cadence and the way that he almost reads yep. like a 1930s serial. I think he's terrific. Okay. Um, do you ever listen to them once you, your books, once they're on audiobook, either, either series? I listen to uh, sometimes, sometimes. I mean, you know, you know how this is, is, you know, by the time you finish with a book. You never want to hear it again. You don't want to hear it again. And it's not because we don't like it. It's because if you have done your work, you have read it. 5,000 times. Yep. And for me, I have read, by the time I finished uh, Someone to Watch Over Me, I had read it 5,000 times. Yep. So maybe in a couple of years, I might listen to it again. But you know, when you listen to it with a really good narrator, and we're not fortunate enough to always have a great narrator. I've had yep. bad narrators before. Um, you know, it's it's a whole different experience, just the way yep. that they, you know, their, their interpretation. Yeah. And Joe Montaigne is, oh, he's, he's fantastic. Uh, for for people watching in the Boston area, um, my mom listened to one of my books and she got like stuck in the Rotary and Bell Circle and Revere because she got so distracted. And I'm like, you cannot listen to the book while you drive anymore. That is not allowed. It's a really nasty Rotary that everyone who's from the North Shore will, will be able to relate to that. Um, let me see. And how did the Parker family kind of find you or reach out to you in the beginning or was that Chris Peppy or I was um already writing uh I had already written four to five books um for uh Putnam which is yep. uh Mr. Parker's longtime publisher yep. and it was known probably around late 2010 that the family was interested in continuing uh his series and initially, when I was asked if I would be interested in, you know, submitting pages, I thought it was for the Jesse Stone books. And yeah. so I started thinking about doing some Jesse Stone books. And then it came yeah. back to me and said, no, 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 it's, it's for Spencer. And I was just elated. I, I mean, I, I love Jesse Stone, but Spencer is so much fun to write for. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, the, the publisher asked me to submit 50 pages. Um, I talked to Chris and she said... Yeah. Uh, you know, do you want me to send you, you know, his backlist? Do you want me to just to get in you know, the Spencer mood just to get you familiar? And I said, I'm such a Parker fan. Yep. I have these books all in first editions. I've been reading wow. Parker since I was 14. I said, I don't have to prep. I yep. said, I can just start writing today. And mm -hmm. so I just started writing and I wrote 50 pages based on that idea of that, that kid yep. uh, that, that believed the guy in death row was innocent. And um, uh, I guess it was a few weeks later, I, I kind of, you know, I didn't know what they were doing with it. I didn't know if how many other people were involved. I didn't know what it had to go through, the channels, whatever. Sure. And I just, I went back to working on, on what I had been writing, which was a Quinn Colson book. And uh, sometime around Christmas, right before Chris called me and she said, uh, the family loved it. I loved it. Um, and um, uh, she, they said, the only thing is Joan Parker uh, wanted to know why she hadn't met you before as a writer from Boston. She thought I was from Boston. Oh, well, she that's said, I, the nicest compliment there was. And then that we, is very high praise. We had to break the news to her that actually I'm a Southerner, which, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that must have hurt. Yeah, yeah, it was. But it was lovely and it was a really nice thing. And I was I was very honored to, 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 to get the gig. Someone asked a question and I suspect the answer will be different for the different series. They asked about, um, and again, people bear with me because I'm kind of trying to scroll here. Um, have you uh, considered killing off an important character? And I assume there are certain restraints perhaps with the, with the Spencer novels and kind of how do you manage that? Because, you know, we all hear about writers who I, I can think of one se mystery series where the author killed off a very prominent character and people went bonkers. Yeah. Um, so do you ever toy with that sort of thing? You know, there hasn't, I haven't, you know, um, like I said, the only constraint that I had when I started writing Spencer, I think that 
And especially after the first few books came out, I think the Parker family knew that I love these books. I knew these books yep. and I wanted to do them in the same style. So there really has never been a discussion among editorial or with the family of, mm -hmm. oh, you can't do this or you can't do this. I think if it fit the story right, um, I think it would work. Um, I think that um, uh, our friend uh, Reed Coleman, a uh, terrific writer who wrote Jesse Stone for a number, number of years and did a great job. He killed off this crime boss named Gino Fish. And I think yeah. that was kind of a bold move, but mm -hmm. I don't think there was any controversy about it. Um, there was a character that was from the very first uh, Spencer novel in the Godwolf manuscript uh, named Joe Braz, mm -hmm. um, uh, who I always felt, and I think was, I'm correct, was based on Whitey Bulger. And so when I first wrote Lullaby, I wrote, I wrote about his death. Yep. Um, you know, I don't think anyone, let's face it, I don't think anyone wants me to kill off Hawk or Susan or anything like that. So I don't think- I don't know, a couple of people might want you to kill off <laughs> they, may, they might, they Sorry. might. Uh, you know, I did, I did in the light, not to, in, no spoilers in this one, but I mean, there's, there is a new pearl in this book. Yeah. So um, I think it's, a, it's kind of that fine balance of, of letting, know, letting you know that there are, there are things on the table, you know, radical things can happen, um, yeah. but um, you know, Again, I think it's all about the consistent, consistency and keeping, yep. keeping those characters we know and love in the story. A couple of people have asked if you would consider either writing short stories, Spencer short stories, or if you would do a spin-off with some of the characters like Six Kill or Maddie. I had thought of Maddie actually. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Um, I think what I've, I hoped I have done, I'm pretty busy uh, and mm -hmm. I am very, very, very fortunate to, uh, to, to be able to continue on uh, Spencer's legacy and to, or Parker's legacy and, and the, these stories. What I've tried to do in a few books is kind of, if any other author, you know, it's kind of a challenge would like to do a spinoff. Um, I think there's something open. There's a character, it was, a, it was Parker's last creation in the book Six Killed. Um, and there's a funny story about that. Many people think I wrote that book and that was Bob's last book that he finished that book completely. And I got, I got letters about it and they said, if you think you can like write like Robert B. Parker, you were sorely mistaken. This was the, it sounds nothing like Robert B. Parker. You, you can't be, and I thought, Jesus, I said, if, if Robert Parker cannot be Robert Parker, then I'm going to have, so I still get crank messages. What hope? What hope? Them. You know, I said, I didn't tell, I mean, Six Kill was his last. So anyway, he created this, this character named Six Kill, who uh, became this protege. And then I ended up kind of, you know, continuing that story. And I have him as a, uh, kind of a spinoff character essentially mm -hmm. in Los Angeles and I would love for somebody to write it I don't have time to do it but I would love for somebody to write a six kill novel I think he's a terrific creation um, and I think Maddie Sullivan would be a great like YA series or something like that yeah. I wish I had time to do it but it's it's really up to you know the estate if they want to hire another writer to do it I, I would love to see it I've kind of I think I've teed it up it's there if yeah 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 definitely um, someone wants to know, and I want to know, what is the best piece of writing advice that you've received that you still use today? Mm. There was, there was a, you know, when I was uh, a young writer a uh, million years ago, um, when I was first starting to try to get into uh, publishing and I was still trying to tell stories and that kind mm. of thing, I, you know, um, I was very lucky to have corresponded with Robert Parker. Um, he was very funny and very dry. And I, I have some letters here in my desk that actually That's exchanged neat. with him years ago. I was very fortunate to do that. And I also was very lucky to uh, cross paths with a, a wonderful writer still working today named James W. Hall. Mm -hmm. And I asked him that very question. And what he told, told me at the time, I kind of was like, oh, thanks. <laughs> you know, I didn't know if it was a really great piece of advice. But now as an older writer, I think it is, is just love what you do. It mm -hmm. goes back to what you were talking about. Tell the kind of stories re to, it is, it's essentially write what you want to read. You know, I, I wanted to read a new, you know, when, when Mr. Parker died, I was devastated because yep. I, I thought, Jesus, and I'm never going to be able to get another Spencer right. novel. And I wanted to write, you know, so I tried to deliver, you know, mm -hmm. and, and hopefully that comes out the kind of book as a fan that I wanted to read. Yep. I didn't necessarily, I'm not trying to write an Ace Atkins novel. If you want to read an Ace Atkins right. novel, read a Quinn Colson book and read, yep. you know, uh, The Revelators. But for me, uh, it was really about trying to, to continue that on. So the best piece of advice goes back to what you and I have talked about, and that's a, advice that uh, Jim Hall gave me years ago, which is enjoy what you're doing, mm -hmm. and write the book that you want to read. And yep. if you don't, then what's the point? You know, you can't write for a market. You can't, you, you can try to do that, but there's yep. no fun in it. There's no fun yeah. in it. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to pick up a, let's see. 
what did you think of the depiction of Susan Silverman as shown in the recent Mark Wahlberg movie? Well, it really wasn't Susan. It was a character named Sissy uh, that they had. Uh, the, the, I know. Did you did you see the movie? I did not. I'll leave it at this. Uh, you are you're better. <laughs> you're. I, you a, know what? I should have lied, but. Um, as a Parker fan and as somebody who loves uh, Robert Parker as much as we do, uh, you're uh, you're probably better off. It was that was kind of that was the it's a, it's a, it's um the the character's name is Spencer in the the film, mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a woman named Sense Sissy. There's a character named Hawk, but it you know I don't I'm not being controversial here. I don't think anyone would disagree yeah. with me. It doesn't resemble anything that Parker had yeah. created. So. How do you have a sense of how involved you'll get to be with the Quinn Colston, the HBO series? Well, we are, you know, it's a weird time right now. Um, yeah. if the, if it we is. Were, it's a very, you know, I don't know if you've known this, but there's strange things going on in the, the world right there now. Are. I think if we had been talking about this last year, Ingrid, um, uh, I think things were moving very quickly. There was an entire first season. Uh, written, we were talking about going to pilot and then all of production uh, for Hollywood and, and for HBO has gone into a holding pattern. So yep. I don't know where we'll be in the next few months. I'm very optimistic that things will change. Uh, yep. But uh, as far as my involvement, I was, I was thrilled to know uh, the scripts that were written that were not written by me were extremely, extremely faithful to the character and to that world. And there was really a um, something built in that was going to be uh, for the for the first uh, several Quinn books was going to follow the story arc for that. So I was very excited. So I hope that um, mm -hmm. when things do continue, that it'll it'll you know continue in that same same tradition. And for those of you at home, uh, just some background information: getting optioned, getting your book optioned is not the hardest thing. But to get as far as what you're talking about with the Quinn Colson series, that is a rare thing. So that's a big. That's a big deal. Well, it was, it's nice. I just, you know, the pandemic has just thrown everything off and, um, yeah. you know, uh, they're just everything, even like when production started revving up again in some capacity, a yep. lot of it has been shut back down again. So I hope when Hollywood is, I don't want to say back to normal because Hollywood's never been normal, but hopefully when things right. move, uh, start business as usual, that, that Quinn will be moving ahead. We'll see. Okay. Um, someone wants to know, Oh, Ace, how does Ace stack up in jacket size versus Spencer? Spencer being a size 48. Uh, I wear, uh, what do I wear? Uh, I do, a, I'm 40, 46, 46. Uh, I think that Parker at one time had Spencer as a 50, uh, 50, uh, 50 long. Too but, much uh, gnocchi from Davios. <laughs> That's... I'm glad we're talking about Davios. They've been so good to me. The, the, the whole family that owns that place has been so nice. And uh, I was in there one time and the owner came over to me and he said, uh, you know, you know, Parker mentions us in his books. He said, I, uh, I continue the same thing. Yeah. Uh, but Boston has been, you know, going back to what you asked me earlier, um, I am not a native of Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, I did not grow up in Boston uh, or the Boston area like you did. Mm -hmm. um, but they, everybody there has been, uh, I kid you not, so warm. Uh, yeah. So uh, so accommodating. Um, I, I wrote a book some years ago about involving the Boston Fire Department, yeah. and all I had to do was pick up the phone and mm -hmm. uh, talk to this wonder guy, wonderful guy named Steve McDonald, and uh, who's the, the the PR guy there. And I said, Steve, I said I'm flying up to Boston on Friday. I said, could you help me with some stuff in the fire department? And when I touched down in Boston within an hour, I was out with the commissioner wow. at, an, at an arson scene. That's and so it's cool. like you know how it is. Boston is. Um, you know, you, New York is, is great, you know, but Boston is a very special place. And yeah. it's what some people I've heard say is a one phone call town. And, oh, interesting. Uh, and, 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 and the connections that I've made there, um, you know, everything from the Patriots to the, yeah. the you know, to the fire department, the police department, um, it just has been wonderful. They're, it's a good city. It's a yeah. great city. It is. Unfortunately, we have a lot of questions, but I don't, we don't have time. So, and I apologize to all of you out there because I think I hogged Ace a little bit, but that's because how great. often do you I get great. this opportunity? And, and, and so, Ingrid, I can't, I wanted to, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say just before, uh, I know we're, we're right out, off the clock, but I, I can't thank you enough for doing this. And they asked me, they said, who would I want to talk to, uh, to talk about Boston, private investigators, crime fiction, 
and you were the immediate person who came to mind. Uh, and, and people who don't know your Fina Ludlow books, they are fantastic. Wow. Uh, people that are Spencer fans, they will love your books uh, because not only the subject matter, the locations, but also the humor, the, the, the smart assisms, the fun, uh, it gives me that very same feeling that uh, when I read Parker's work. So well, uh, that's very first, kind and very generous, first. and you're just proving the point about crime writers being the nicest people. So thank you all of you out there, out in the ether, for joining us, and thank you for the libraries north of Boston and Wellesley Books. I loved this book. I just tore right through it. I think you guys will love it too, and um, hopefully I'll get to actually see you in person before too long. Absolutely. Either 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 on the, the West Coast where you are or yep. uh, in Boston sometime soon, but uh, things will get better for all of us. So yes. cheers. Cheers to everyone who's out there. Agreed. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Thanks, Ingrid. Sure. Thanks.